Hi, this is Joe from Mapamundi, and in today's video I would like to talk about historical and comparative linguistics. So if you've watched my videos before, you've probably seen me do this kind of um, comparative method before. And um, today I just wanted to show kind of a little bit how it works uh, and what the kind of ramifications are uh, for historical linguistics and how it might show us how languages evolve from other languages. And um, I'll also show you some other things that we can do to kind of make uh, hypotheses about the ways that languages are related from a similar source. And in today's video, I chose examples of words from um, Germanic, Italic, and Celtic uh, language families, but there are a lot more language families out there. Um, uh, I wanted to keep it kind of simple today, and I am simplifying a lot of the materials. Uh, so I didn't take a look at Slavic languages, I didn't take a look at Indo-Iranian languages, uh, Greek, Albanian, Armenian. Um, those languages as well are languages that are uh, Indo-European, which means they do come from a common ancestor as Celtic, Italic, and Germanic languages, but for the sake of simplicity today we're just going to focus on those three branches that I listed before. Those are also the three branches that I'm most familiar with of all the branches of the Indo-European languages. And that language, it spread uh, west through Europe, it spread southeast through India, uh, it spread east to um, what is now western China, and um, it's existed in these regions for hundreds of years, and as we know, uh, languages can change over time. Uh, that change does not have to be quick necessarily, but when you consider that this language has existed for, you know, thousands of years, the uh, potential for it to change sound, uh, it's something that happens, um, we can see happening in these languages as we compare them to one another. So by comparing these languages, we can get some kind of idea of what the, um, the parent language might have sounded like, because Proto-Indo-European is not a written language. There are no written records of this language in existence. So let's take a look at two charts that are trying to showcase different sound shifts that happen in these languages, and I'm going to walk you through them and show you what these, um, these words have to say about the uh, relationship between these language families. So in the first chart here, we have, um, as you can see in the Germanic column in English, the words fish, father, and foot. Uh, and if you look at those words in the Germanic languages, they are all pronounced with fa sounds. Um, we can see in Dutch and German they're spelled with V's, some of these words, but uh, it doesn't matter because they're pronounced with fa sounds. And um, spelling is kind of like a thing that is created by human beings, but these sounds are what's more important. It doesn't really matter how they're spelled because if a V and an F both make fa, then you're really saying the same sound regardless of how it's spelled. So if we look at these words in German, we can see fish, fata, fuss. Uh, we can see in Norwegian and Swedish, fisk, far, and fot. Um, and we can see similar words in Dutch and Icelandic. They all begin with fa sounds, right? But what do we see when we take a look at the Italic versions? Uh, in the Italic versions, in the words that um, come from Latin and Latin itself, we can see that all these words begin with a pa sound, right? In Latin, I have piscis, pater, pes. In Italian, I have pesce, padre, piede. In French, I have poisson, per, and pied. And it goes so on and so forth. So you, as somebody that's trying to take a look at these languages, what kind of information might that indicate about the relationship between Germanic languages and Italic languages? Well, if we can see that all of the Germanic sounds begin with a fa, and all the Italic sounds begin with a pa, then it would seem like there's a relationship between these pa sounds and these fa sounds, and that words that begin with pa sounds in the Italic language, they change to fa sounds in the Germanic language. Um, and I'm only saying that because uh, we know that that's what happened and it wasn't a fa that changed to a pa and um, we know that by comparing them to other uh, language families that I don't have uh, written here in this chart. But um, we know that pa changed to fa in Germanic languages by comparing other language families and um, that's a very strong correspondence we can see with the words as given. Now, what does this say about the Celtic languages? In Irish I have the word iask as fish, I have ahar for father, and I have this word um, ish, or is probably as it's pronounced in Old Irish. Um, those words, uh, iask, ahar, and is, um, they don't have any consonant sound before them. Uh, so what we might be able to tell about these Celtic languages is that these initial pa sounds, uh, that they eventually go away. They probably had a shift from pa to fa to ha, and then eventually gone away completely. Um, 
uh, and as you might note, uh, the word for foot in modern Irish is actually not is, it actually means down, which um, it's related to the word for foot uh, in the Proto-Indo-European language. Uh, but the word for foot in Irish is chos, um, which uh, is not related to these other words in these uh, languages. And that's something that we have to be careful of when we're looking at um, these comparative methods, that uh, the modern word that we use to express something, it might not be the word that was used historically, um, and it might not be the cognate word that's used for other languages. Even if a word looks very similar to one another, it does not necessarily mean that those words are related. And even if a word looks very drastic, two words look very drastically different from one another, uh, it doesn't mean that they're not related. And we're going to see examples of that in the next chart. Um, some other things that we might be able to um, notice by looking at the relationship between these words if we do a kind of like more uh, specific analysis in the language families. Uh, some things you might notice, right? Fish, fish, fisk, right? Uh, we have fiskur in uh, Icelandic. Uh, in uh, English, we have father. In German, fater. In Dutch, father. In Icelandic, fathir. So, what might that say about Norwegian and Swedish, that the word in Norwegian and Swedish is far? Um, it would indicate to me that at some point in time in Norwegian and Swedish that there was a kind of th or the or da sound there, and, then, and that it went away as, um, as the years went by. Uh, we can also make assumptions about German, right? German is the outlier, and that we have in German the word for foot is fuss. In English, I have foot. In Norwegian and Swedish, I have foot. In Icelandic, I have footer. So it would indicate that probably in German there was some kind of sound shift between t and sa. And uh, I've only given one example of these kinds of things, but these are things we can look at in later videos. Um, but these are the kind of things that you notice when you start comparing languages like this that not always, but sometimes, I would say it's a good, it's a good um, starting point. If you have words from 10 languages and nine of those languages do the same thing, and one of them does something different, it's worth looking into to see if that one thing is an aberration and, and the nine things that change are um, the original form or, the, or the, more, um, the more antiquated form, let's say. But it doesn't necessarily always mean that, right? You could have um, languages where the nine things changed and that one thing is the only one that remained constant. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the one thing that's an outlier is the thing that's a new or innovated sound. Um, but, but it's a good idea to work off of that um, assumption. And we can also see that the word for father in Romanian is tate. Um, so presumably uh, this word does not come from the same root as um, pater and padre and father. Um, we, there is a word in Latin, tata, which means um, father, and it's kind of like daddy or dad. Uh, it's kind of like um, based off of child speak, like dada or tata. Um, so the Romanian word tata, um, it does not come from the same place, even though it does mean father, and it does have a um, Latin corresponding word, but it's not the word pater. Uh, the next chart that I have here is um, words for hundred. I have an English hound, and I have have. And I chose the word hound instead of dog, which is what these words mean in most other languages as we see them. Um, because as I said before, the word dog does not come from the same place as these words. This word hound is the one that's a cognate with all the other languages. Um, and even though it has a more specific meaning in English now, but it's a type of dog, originally that word hound was just an all-purpose word for any kind of dog. Uh, and we can see that happening in languages, this kind of process of semantic narrowing where a word might have a general meaning and then it becomes more specific over time and, and generally there's another word that comes in and takes the more general meaning or replaces the word. Uh, so I have hundred, hound and have. In German I have hundet, hund and haben. Uh, in Norwegian and Swedish I have hundra, hund and ha. So we can see that those all begin with ha sounds in the Germanic languages. What if I look at the Italic languages? In Latin I have kentum, I have canis, and I have capio. And some of you that studied um, Latin, you might be thinking, uh, why did he choose capio? Because um, the verb for have uh, in Latin is not capio. Uh, there's a more um, habeo, which means have, right? But look, this is the situation. Even though habeo and have and haben 
look so similar to one another, they are actually not cognates, they're not related to the same word. And we can see that from these things we have here, that these ka sounds in italic, they correspond to ha sounds in Germanic, right? In Italian, I have cento, cane, and capire. Uh, in French, I have son, chien, and um, there's no verb form, but I have capture, which means to capture. Uh, in Spanish, I have ciento. Uh, I have uh, an older-fashioned word, can, and I have the verb caber, which means to fit, actually. So one thing to keep in mind as we're doing these historical comparisons is that the meanings of the words might change slightly, right? Capire in Italian means to understand, right? When you get something in your head, when you see some information, you understand it. Caber in Spanish means to fit, right? When you take something and put it in somewhere, it's, it's, you're making it fit, right? So these come from the Latin word capio, which means to seize or capture. Um, but they don't mean the same thing necessarily as um, the Latin antecedent. And um, some of you might be noticing that in the words for hundred in the Romance languages that they all kind of begin with a softer su sound or a ch sound or a th sound if you're um, speaking Spain from Spanish from Spain. Um, and that's because we can see in the italic languages when Latin shifts to the Romance languages that a C sound before E or E, it softens and becomes cha or sa or th if you're going with the um, Spain kind of pronunciation of Spanish. However, we don't see that happening with words like cane or ca or can. We do see it happening in French, interestingly enough, and that's a uh, um, a kind of specific thing in French where a ca sound becomes a cha sound, right? If I have the verb cantar in Spanish, it's chanter in French, right? If I have the word um, hot in French, right, caliente, I have the word chaud in French. So that's a common thing that happens, um, and it's specific to French. Uh, but we have otherwise other examples like capture, which does not, it's not chapture, but it's capture, right? Um, the Romanian word, even though it looks I suppose similar enough to the Latin word uh, suta uh, means a hundred. Um, it's not, a, I shouldn't say it's, it does come from Indo-European, uh, but it doesn't come from Latin and that's the reason why I highlighted it because it's slightly different. Uh, it comes from, I think, Slavic. Um, it's a s kind of satim um, uh, version of the word for a hundred. And looking at the Celtic languages, we can see that there's the same situation happening here, uh, where the word for 100 in Irish is caid, the word for hound in Irish is coo, um, the word for dog in Irish is madra, um, but that's a newer word. Coo in Irish used to mean dog in general, and now it means a hound. And in Scottish Gaelic, I believe that um, coo is the word for, for all types of dogs. Um, I'm not as familiar with Scottish Gaelic, but uh, we can also see in um, the words for capture or have or seize, that the word for that in the Irish or, or Gaelic languages, let's say, is cuan, um, which means a bay or a harbor. And that's a really interesting example of um, semantic shift because the word has shifted all the way from meaning seize or capture to meaning bay or harbor, which I suppose a bay or harbor, it either captures or fits ships in it or it's something that can be captured in warfare. Uh, I'm not really sure what the kind of like philosophical, psychological path to get from seas to bay or harbor was, but I believe it's probably something like that in that you fit ships into a harbor, right? And I know this isn't a video about Manx, but I believe it's, it's worth saying is that when you look at Manx compared to um, Irish or Scottish Gaelic, it looks kind of goofy in the way that it's spelled. And um, I think think that the reason why that is is because uh, even though it is a Gaelic language, its, it's phonetic way of spelling is based on um, English phonetics because I believe that they were taught to read and write by um, English people, um, potentially monks, I'm not really sure. So that's why when you see words in Irish like um, ku, right, it's spelled C-U, but it's spelled C-O-O in Manx, and that O-O in uh, English, it usually makes an U sound, right? Um, same thing with the word kid. If I have kid, in um, Irish, which is with an A with an accent, or an E with an accent, I should say. Uh, the double E in Manx makes this kind of E sound, right? Um, so it's interesting because it's also a good tool to look at Manx and then compare it back to English 
to get some kind of idea about what English would have sounded like um, in that time period um, since I think it was the 15 or 1600s when this was um, starting this kind of learning to read and write for the Manx people who were largely illiterate before that point in time. So I hope this video was interesting to you all. Uh, this really is just a very simplified kind of introduction to uh, the comparative method of linguistics. Uh, we've really only scratched the surface with this video uh, and there's so much more to say and there's actually a lot more specificity that comes into play. Uh, I really simplified a lot of sounds from just saying like, you know, ka or ha. Um, and there can be different versions of a ka sound, right? There can be different versions of a ha sound. Um, but this gives a good idea of how we go about making this, these kinds of comparisons between language families. And it also, uh, I think, hopefully will make you start to look at words between different languages with a more kind of like, uh, with more open eyes and be able to make some more comparisons uh, for yourself that are interesting to find. So if you enjoy this video and you want to see more videos just like this one, be sure to subscribe to my channel, Mapamundi Languages, to see a new video coming out every Friday.